hammerless and uh, gavelless, so I'm using my cup tonight. So oh. that's, uh, that's but I'm going to retrieve it in just a minute. So uh, we're going to call the work session for February 27th to order. And uh, as usual, we start out with citizen comments. Uh, tonight we have John Thompson that contacted me uh, uh, on an issue and uh, on an issue that we had had before the board. Uh, before and I offered him a moment to uh, speak and uh, I, I've given him 10 minutes to give his presentation um, and of course there will be some opportunity if you have questions but also he's given you a lot of literature so uh, John uh, we know who you are come on up and sit right here in front of the microphone and uh, we'll start timing you right now. Okay. Well, Mayor, thank you for having me. Thank you, council members, for allowing me to take the opportunity to speak with you for a few minutes. The reason I am here tonight is uh, I am, my, actually myself and my wife, are in opposition to the new proposed city ordinance banning the sale of dogs and cats in pet stores. And I want to start by giving you a little bit of history uh, behind how our store came about. My wife and I opened the Pothic Puppy Boutique and Nursery about two years ago, and prior to opening our store, I was a vice president for a large corporation for 17 years, and my wife and I are both huge animal lovers, and this was an idea that my wife had presented to me more times in the last seven or eight years than what I really wanted to hear because she was a stay-at-home mom, and she didn't work and I had a comfortable living but uh, my wife kept convincing me that we needed to provide this opportunity to the community and I have an undergraduate degree in business administration with a minor in animal behavioral science uh, I have trained dogs in the past uh, I showed dogs for a little over eight years so a good portion of my life I have spent around dogs and other animals. Uh, my wife and I have invested a little over three years of our time and over a hundred thousand dollars in our personal funds to open and operate our business that's located on, jo on Jordan Road. Uh, my wife and I traveled and spent over a year visiting and vetting breeders. Uh, we also interviewed uh, and spoke with specialized transportation companies that were set up to transport uh, our animals for us. Uh, we met with the commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. I met with Diona Layden, who is the general counsel for the Tennessee Department of Health. Uh, I met with the assistant veterinarian in the state of Tennessee, and I also met with local veterinarians prior to opening our business. Uh, my wife and I opened our business right around two years ago, and in the last two years, we have sold a little over 700 puppies. And we have uh, uh, most of our business and our customers uh, actually come from the Franklin and Brentwood area, and most of that is through word of mouth. And uh, I, uh, my wife and I, prior to me quitting my job and uh, deciding to be a puppy caretaker every day, uh, I told my wife that the only way I would consider doing this is if I did it, if we were willing to do it, what I felt like was the right way at the best that we could possibly do. And I've owned three other businesses in my lifetime and I actually started my first business when I was a senior in college and fortunately it was successful enough to allow me to buy two other businesses and I sold them after 17 years and went into uh, the uh, real estate world of residential home building and became a vice president for the largest national home building company in the United States and they build about 37,000 houses a year. But anyway, I have provided you guys with handouts uh, that hopefully uh, you will take the time to look at and read through because Part of my purpose here is that uh, I know from the uh, pieces that I saw that ran on the news and obviously they came out and interviewed me and uh, there was some concern there about 
commercial breeders and puppy mills and uh, unfortunately the word puppy mill is a term that gets thrown around very loosely uh, and pretty much uh, gets thwarted toward anybody that's in the business of breeding dogs. They are a puppy mill, uh, and it's absolutely not true. Uh, and I have provided you with documentation to show you that that is not the case. Uh, I know that the city in the proposed ordinance had some concerns about uh, the lack of, uh, uh, or that puppy mills lead to health and behavioral issues in animals. And I wanna say having a minor in animal behavior science, I can tell you that most puppies from the time they're born until they're eight weeks old care nothing about uh, socialization and behavioral problems. All they're interested in is nursing on their mama and spending time with her. Uh, also too, uh, dogs are not genetically born with behavioral problems, unfortunately. The behavioral problems that they developed, we as people create those behavioral problems because we don't properly socialize our animals and we don't really understand uh, or treat them how they think, so to speak. But anyway, uh, I know there were also some health concerns and I gave you some information about the Campylobacter Bacter, uh, outbreak that occurred uh, that was related to the 100 cases were related to pet land. And in the two years I've been in business, the CDC says there's been 2.6 million outbreaks of that particular type of bacteria here in the United States. And 100 cases out of 2.6 million is a very, very low number. Uh, so I'm not really sure how big of a health risk that pet stores are attributing to those type of outbreaks every year. It also says that current federal and state regulations do not properly address the sale of puppy and kitten mill dogs and cats in pet stores. Well, every breeder in the United States that sells a dog or cat to a pet store has to be licensed with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The U.S. Department of Agriculture regulates them under the well Animal Welfare Act, and there are 157 pages of regulations and guidelines they have to follow in order to get and maintain their license. They get inspected on a regular basis. Uh, my wife and I, our store is actually also uh, licensed with the Tennessee Department of Health, the Division of Animal Welfare. Uh, we are also an American Kennel Club certified partner store. I get inspected by the Department of Agriculture with the state of Tennessee. I get inspected by the American Kennel Club. I also get inspected on occasion from the Williamson County Animal Control. Uh, I have never in the two years that I've been in business had problems with any type of inspection. As a matter of fact, one of the head guys at the Williamson County Animal Control the last time he was there and toured my facility in my kennel room, he made the comment to me that uh, my kennel room and store was actually cleaner than the Williamson County Animal Shelter is. Uh, and, and I think the Williamson County Animal Shelter does a great job. But at the same time, uh, to prohibit the sale of commercial bred puppies, there again, uh, a commercial breeder is a loose term from the standpoint that the if you if you google a commer commercial dog breeding uh it comes up under Wiki wikipedia defines that a commercial dog breeding facility is a puppy mill sometimes known as a puppy farm well that's not always true if you uh look at the website for uh the animal uh legal and historical center it says generally they're not always a commercial dog breeder is defined as someone who breeds a large number of dogs usually 20 or more within a certain time frame usually 12 months then the humane society says that a commercial breeder is any breeder who maintains 39 or more breeding females on site within a 12-month period of time whereas the usda uh, defines a commercial breeder as any breeder who maintains four more breeding females on site, sells puppies directly to pet stores, or sells puppies that are to be transported across state lines. So there are currently federal 
and state laws in place that regulate the sale of dogs and cats in pet stores. And I, uh, I guess part of what I am mostly opposed to uh, in this proposed ordinance is that the city wants to restrict my business to where I can only source my dogs from an animal care facility or an animal rescue organization. And I can tell you if that were to pass, it would be a death sentence to my business. And here is why. Uh, all animal care facilities and animal rescue organizations are nonprofit organizations. They are not required to be licensed through the state of Tennessee. They're not required to be licensed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They are not regulated. They are not inspected on a regular basis like I am. Uh, they also cannot give you any background information on the dogs, dogs that they source there. Uh, so every breeder that I do business with, that breeder is required to take that puppy to a licensed veterinarian and have a full health exam done and that, that veterinarian has a form they have to fill out. When the driver goes to pick the puppy up, that form has to be given to the driver along with a dog disposition form from the Department of Agriculture within that state. When they arrive in my store, I have a store veterinarian that works two days a week that comes in and also does a full health exam on every puppy. I have given you copies yeah. of our uh, our uh, yeah, health I'm, record. I'm going to stop stop you right there, and I, okay. because I said I'd give you ten, okay. and everybody has this, and I wanted to leave just a few minutes uh, for some questions from uh, sta uh, Alderman Alderman McClendon. Let's assume a hypothetical regulatory environment where you are allowed to sell only puppies that you had sourced from the shelter, the local shelter, or whatever the whatever the ordinance that was floated says. Yes, sir. Forget whether or not you can make money doing that. I think that's a separate question, but forget whether you can make money. Could you take these dogs that are rescue animals and sell them through your store and maintain your licensure and your standing with the U.S. ADA and AKC? No, sir. Why not? Well, partly because there are not enough available puppies at the local animal shelter or local rescues, say here in Nashville, that could provide me with the number of dogs that I sell every month in my store. <clears throat> I think, uh, let me make sure you understand the question. Ignore for a moment the, the business model. Correct. Okay. Let's assume that that's not a problem. You have unlimited supply. Could you comply with a the ordinance that was proposed and comply with the USADA and, AK and or AKC in terms of the dogs that you have and the, uh, in particular, is there any kind of requirement that you're that the dogs that you sell in the store, as far as the USADA and or AKC are concerned, do they require you to have like a chain of custody or a source, some kind of, some well, kind of um, background on the animal? The, if I sourced my puppies from <coughs> animal shelters or rescue organizations that were out of state, they would be required to be licensed with the U.S. Department of Agriculture because those puppies would be transported across state lines. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any rescue organization out there that's licensed with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And I don't know if they would go through what it would take to meet that requirement. So and the first thing that would happen is, they for all practical purposes, you would be local, you would be limited to local rescue dogs. Correct and they could not supply me with the puppies that I need in my store. Secondly, you mean, I, as, a num as a volume? As a volume, and secondly, it's something that I would not do because I would not put my store or personal reputation on the line from the standpoint that 
you would be asking me then to turn around and sell puppies to the citizens of Franklin here that I have no knowledge of the background history of where that puppy came from, the disposition of that puppy, what type of personality that puppy has, whether that puppy is dangerous or not, or that dog is dangerous or not. Part of the literature that I've given you is there are, there's information there and website links of the numerous occasions across the country where people have rescued or adopted a dog and have been killed within hours of rescuing that dog where the shelter or the rescue organization told them that the dog was adoptable and the dog was friendly and that turned out not to be the case. I don't know if any of you saw in the news last week where the 22 year old girl in Virginia adopted two pit bulls and she was very experienced in handling dogs and had uh, a lot of work in that area and she took her two pit bulls for a walk in the park and they mauled her to death and when the police arrived the dogs were actually eating her rib cage. It was a horrific scene. There was another case recently where some people rescued a dog and they took it home and within three hours it mauled their yeah. child and they're now suing the rescue organization. Mm. Um, so you, all right, but as far as you know, you wouldn't, your license, did you say you're licensed by the USADA? U U.S. Department of Agriculture in the state of Tennessee. Okay. It, would it compromise that license if you were to source dogs only from the local rescue? That's something I would have to talk with the Department of Agriculture and the uh, Tennessee Department of Agriculture as well and find out. I okay. don't, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I, would, I mean, aside from other feelings and opinions, well, I don't really have feelings, but aside from, aside from the uh, other opinions I have about this, draft ordinance it would bother me to learn that you would your your existing licensure would be jeopardized merely by trying to trying to uh, obey this ordinance were it passed well i i think part of the biggest problem that i foresee here and part of what has made my business successful and i've provided you literature with on this is that I am not required under state law to offer a warranty or any type of guarantee with my puppies, and I've taken it upon myself to do so. Uh, I also, my wife and I, were the first people in the state of Tennessee to apply for a dog and cat dealer's license that actually had a veterinarian certified exercise plan put in place for all of our puppies that are in the store. Uh, we. I'm going to stop you there. If, if that's okay. That's all the questions I have. Yeah. And see if there's some more questions. I've got Alderman Burgers and Alderman Martin. Um, okay, so the exercise, I got, I've got a number of things. I'm going to be quick. Exercise plan. So there's no grass, no place to walk those dogs near you. In Correct. That. So my, my, in my store, we have what we call puppy parks that are fenced that we built. I know, but uh, they don't get outside, do they? The city does not allow us to take them yeah. outside, no ma'am. So your, your dogs are inside. Um, the, um, the, according to the USDA, USDA all dogs um, bred in mills or in puppy breeding mills that have, <clears throat> they are not required to be let out of their cages, by the way. Um, so any, any breeder that's producing puppies never, ha never has to let the dogs outside the cages ever. Um, uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to see your breeder records if you would make those available. Uh, I'd like to see a, a, um, a copy of your guarantee that you give the people purchasing your dogs. And I, I, I did um, ask um, uh, the Department of Agriculture, Charles Hatcher, <clears throat> and he said, we do not inspect pet stores only if they are a dealer. Um, in the last weeks, the dog cat dealer inspection licensing responsibility was transferred back to us from the Department of Health. So I wanted to know about that. Um, when you reference the pit bulls, um, you know, I won't be descriptive, descriptive, just very descriptive like that, but I would say that <clears throat> you can pick out any example throughout the United States and the world. Um, that happens all the time, but pit bulls are known known to attack people they're known for that that breed is especially known for that but um 
anyway, I, I think that there are some things I, I would feel more comfortable knowing yeah. about your breeders. The other thing is, I do believe one time that you had a breeder uh, that you, you that was responsible breeder that was on the horrible 100 list. Um, so I would question, you know, who, where your breeders are coming from, uh, the records of your breeders, because there are breeders that um, are most responsible breeders from the knowledge that I have are not selling to retail pet stores. And um, I would just make those comments um, to obtain that information. That's all. all Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, we've been to your store, and it was all I could do to keep Bob from taking one of them. <laughs> he, but they were puppies. They were puppies. But, but we told you, you know, what we wanted. We, we <coughs> want, I wanted one that didn't shed. Correct. And we want one that had a good disposition. Well, see, you could do that. I mean, you could. Now, whether you were telling the truth or not, I don't know. But you said you could work that out. Yes, ma'am, we do that all the time, and that is probably 80% of our business is that people come in, and most of our business is word of mouth. I, in two years, have spent zero dollars on advertising. Most of my business is word of mouth, and most of my cu our customers are looking for mixed breeds that are hypoallergenic because they don't want to deal with the shedding and the hair inside their house. Uh, you can't go to a rescue or an animal shelter and then tell you exactly what type of puppy that is unless they have spent the money to DNA test That's it. That's true. And then also, the pu it's not a puppy. M most of the time, they are Correct. older dogs. Correct. And if you wanted a rescue dog or if you wanted a dog from a shelter, you could just go and get one. Absolutely. But if you want something in particular, then you'd have to go through somebody like you. Correct. Do you breed at all? No, ma'am, I do you not. You just sell. No, ma'am, I do not. Right, and, and in answer to hmm. your, your questions, I'm sorry, I don't remember That's your name. Beverly. Beverly? Mm -hmm. Beverly, I provided you with information because you brought up the breeders that I do business with. I have given you a couple of USDA reports on a couple of my breeders. There are also pictures there of one of those breeders' kennel facility as well as their nursing facility. And as part of their facility, they have exercise pens where they allow those dogs to, all of their dogs to go out and get exercise. So they are not confined to cages all the time as you, you may think they are. Uh, and most breeders nowadays and- That's in the package then? It is I'm part, of, go to, uh, part right. of the pack. Yeah, I just, I mean, I appreciate you being here tonight. We did mm -hmm. hear from Ms. Cunningham last meeting. I, I don't know where we stand yet as far as whether this is even our decision to make. Um, I've not been in your store. I have a teenage daughter that you go visit frequently. Um, and we ended up sourcing our new puppy from another place. Um, and I've heard horror stories. I hate to tell you that. But I just, I think that we've got to travel down this road a bit longer if this is our decision and and the process is more than just this board the process involves the public speaking and and different things like that i appreciate the effort you put into this but i feel like we're balancing a ball around that we don't even know if we have possession of so well, um and not to say that you're not here to fight for for your business and i get that but um well i can tell you that there was also a bill that was sponsored by the humane society and other uh animal activist groups here in the state of tennessee that was put before the state legislature and uh they called it the puppy mill ban and it was voted down by the agricultural committee last week on the 22nd it was never even sent to the floor uh, the bill got squished and also i've provided you information that within the last week there has been a bill presented in the state legislature in uh, georgia to overturn the local pet store ordinance bans uh, and there are approximately 60 of those ordinances in the state of uh, Georgia last week there was also one presented in the state legislature to overturn the same thing in the yeah. state of Florida there was yeah. one also overturned in Las Vegas in I November. I think all that's in the packet. Everything's John? in the yeah. packet. Yes sir. Well I'm gonna 
we need to move on with the okay. rest of it and we've given a lot of liberty as far as uh, citizen okay. comments uh, much more than usual um, and so uh, we're going to move on. This is going to be coming yeah. on our agenda at some point in time down the road. Uh, yeah. And so I would we're ask doing some additional yeah. research yeah. based yeah. on the discussion last mm -hmm. week and this week, and we'll bring some more information mm -hmm. back. It'll be time for public. Uh, more I, public. I would yeah. ask um, that when it does come back to book session, it is now almost 5.30. Yeah. So that's 30 minutes. Of, of, of give and take, pres 15 minutes of presentation. Well, and, this is my I, prerogative on yeah, burger, what I, I did. I know. And I last ask. meeting, yeah. I, I cut off some of the discussion because mm -hmm. I was concerned that the discussion was heading in definitely the wrong way rather than being factual about uh, what they were mm -hmm. trying to present. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that uh, mm -hmm. there was going to be a lot of negative comments about businesses and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that was my interpretation, yeah. and that was my prerogative. It, it was, Mr. Mayor, and uh, but but I would uh, respectfully say I think sometimes we can jump the gun on that. In that, um, if, if I did, is, I apologize, but back, that was my feeling at that time. Um, and if this is back <coughs> on the 13th or whenever it is, for it'll um, certainly we, be open for public ample, comment. Ample time. Absolutely. Uh, for the agenda item. Yeah. Thank you. But we did hold him to 10 minutes on his public comments, and mm -hmm. the board had the opportunity to ask questions. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. the next is uh, Franklin Sustainability yeah. Commission update. So, uh, Dana. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Andrew. I wanted to uh, recognize Dana Coase, who serves as the chair of the Franklin Sustainability Commission uh, here tonight. Um, we're going to go through these pretty quickly. Just wanted to touch on a couple of the priorities the commission has identified for this year. I'd also like to recognize all the members that serve on the commission. Uh, Dana being the chair, Bob Mario, who works for TASSER, the vice chair, Mike Leonard, who's our newest member, he's an, uh, he's an architect, Will Dodson, who works for USDA, Patrick Baggett, the Franklin Tomorrow representative, Micah Wood, who uh, was formerly on staff here, now he works for Volkert. Nancy Whittemore, who's a downtown resident and is the director of Metro General Services. And Todd Palmer, who works for Middle Tennessee Electric, who is uh, Middle Tennessee Electric has been a great partner uh, for the last eight years. And uh, they've been very <coughs> consistent, steadfast. And Alderman Berger, who's our, our new uh, BOMA liaison. <coughs> Some of the uh, priorities, well, litter reduction, and we've We've made a dent in it so far. The uh, city staff has been more engaged and more active in getting litter off the streets. The, so, the uh, inmates led by Sergeant Stevens are active all <laughs> over the county and they've been a great partner. Um, I have a, a good rapport with him and I'm able to let him know of areas that are littered. So as you aldermen see streets that need to get picked up, let me know and I'm happy to communicate that. And, uh, <coughs> that information goes to you. We'll it, call you with it. That's and then fine. you'll take care of it. I'll so do right. my best. <laughs> okay. I'll Great. do my best. Great. Yes. Because I never know who to call. Spencer. You can call me. I'll okay. run point Spencer on it. Creek. Okay. Spencer Creek. Yes, sir. We've identified yeah, we that one. And I'll, <coughs> our I'll communicate that. Our also works on yeah. it. Well, Jeff, they don't yeah. pick yeah. it up. Yes, uh, they do. They yes, have. They do. Yes. Oh, they, they do? Have. Yeah. They're out there this morning, actually. Thank you. Okay. There's Joe. Thanks, Joe. So as, as the city continues to grow, it's going to increasingly become a problem. So we can go out there and pick it up, but we also need to be active um, mm. preventing it before it occurs. So that's something we're going to continue to chip away on. And Melissa and Steven in the communications division have been crucial in getting the word out. Um, would you? Okay, it's still up there. <coughs> in terms of glass recycling, that's something we want to take another look at. We've considered it over the years, and um, I think it's time to revisit it. Some of our um, counterparts across the state, like Gallatin and Cumberland <coughs> County, have figured out ways to collect glass, pulverize it, and then use it. Um, so I think, I think there are some options, and we'd like to explore those. Energy efficient lighting. Street lights, it's uh, been somewhat of a personal crusade since I started working <laughs> here. Uh, we spend a lot of money on street lights, and there yeah. are a lot of savings to be had with street lights. And I, I am happy to report that we've experienced some savings from 2008 um, to where we are now. We're spending a lot less overall on energy usage and maintenance. 
Um, the city owns and maintains about 10% of all street lights. Middle Tennessee owns and maintains the remaining approximately 90%. Um, of the lights that we own and maintain, the usage has gone down. Um, <clears throat> for the lights that Middle Tennessee Electric owns and maintains, we keep adding lights every year. We've probably added 500 new street lights since 2008. Middle Tennessee has changed the way they bill for maintenance. Instead of it being a, uh, a formula, they have started billing us on straight maintenance. So we've seen a significant savings and that's that's a lot of what you're seeing there. And we're also doing some pilot projects with them with LEDs. And uh, Dana's talk about the Lead for Cities. So the Lead for Cities is another 2018 priority for us. We started investigating last mm -hmm. fall um, it entails the city providing data in the five categories that you see on the screen. We enter the data into what's called the ARC platform, uh, which was developed by the U.S. Green Building Council. From there, we can either just use that ARC platform to be able to continually update data, track performance, see where we should shift our priorities in the future. Uh, we can also take it to the next step and get the Lead for Cities certification. So we currently have a complimentary access to the ARC platform and we have data in there. Um, we've, I should say, preliminary data based on a lot of um, data that's public. We've negotiated rates with the U.S. Green Building Council. They, at this point, have cut them by over two thirds. Um, and so our next step is we're uh, working to try to find funding to take it to the next step and. Um, pursue Lead for Cities certification for the city of Franklin. Mm -hmm. And then three more priorities to talk about. These are newer priorities for us. Uh, the first is public outreach and branding, really to let the public get more familiar with the Sustainability Commission, what we do, <coughs> as well as how they can live more sustainably. Uh, another newish one is the green business practices, something that we talked about once last year, but we mm -hmm. want to take it to the next level, see if we can partner with the chamber to encourage mm -hmm. our, the businesses in our community to implement more sustainability. And then last but not least is the dockless bike sharing that Alderman Berger brought to us. That's the newest one just last month. Mm -hmm. So um, dockless bike sharing uh, eliminates the need for the bike rack infrastructure but still allows people to share bikes and get around our community with those bikes instead of driving. And there's no cost to the city. It's mm -hmm. all paid. It's pay as you go by the user with an app on your phone. So that rounds out our priorities for 2018. So thanks for letting us share them with you. And we look forward to any questions or discussion. I was seeing about the bike. Uh, how many years ago did we receive some kind of grant for bikes i don't know the tma group did for uh didn't bike sharing it was a few years ago yeah no we i think the tma group Debbie said they, the they were not awarded the grant they dropped it couldn't, it was with pat emory couldn't get the match couldn't get the match okay, okay. that was the problem exactly. okay so we couldn't do thank it. you yeah. so I, I remember we talked to pat emory about mm -hmm. that and then debbie said we had to let it go and and that that was because and you know, we had to uh, pay for that, mm -hmm. and with the dockless bike system would eliminate that. The yeah. companies and the city doesn't they don't have any cost. Mm -hmm. And I'll be interested to learn more about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it works uh, really. It's working very. It's a very interesting program working in different cities right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments. <clears throat> Well, you'll, uh, yeah, okay. I've asked uh, staff to periodically bring one of our commissions in to give a report and update on what they're doing. So, great report. And thanks for the great work you're doing and look forward to you bringing uh, recommendations for us. I, I Thank you. Oh, excuse Alderman me. Alderman Martin. One and question. Then I'll get Alderman. Uh, <coughs> the green business practices. Mm -hmm. I'd be sort of interested in knowing what that's all about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you're talking about. So there's, it's called the Green Business Initiative that would, um, we would partner with the chamber to get in front of businesses to help implement recycling and um, 
generally other sustainability practices, you know, green cleaning, um, improved air energy quality, efficiency. energy okay. efficiency. Actually, there's a problem yeah. with recycling it downtown. Mm. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they've complained to me about it, and, and you know, I don't know what to do about it, but it's the picking up, you know, in a business, in a commercial area, it's different from the blue bags in right. the exactly. residential area. So, you know, there mm -hmm. is a need there. Mm -hmm. You're right. So you All might want to delve into that a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a law against littering, right? It's just trying to enforce it, littering. It's I mean, you can't just enforce. throw stuff. Yeah. So how do we, yeah. it's, it's difficult to enforce yeah. that because the car is gone and whatever, so we just have mm -hmm. to go into the communities and pick yeah. things up off streets. Yeah, Unfortunately, is. we can't enforce. Unless they see it. Unless, and. Yeah, yeah. and report it. A lot of the litter is unintentional. If it's yeah. flying out of truck beds and, you know, large trucks, that's a lot of it. Okay. And we have a cover law here. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if the police see something coming mm -hmm. out of a truck, first of all, if they see a truck not covered, mm -hmm. they can stop and they cite them. But if they also see debris coming out from a truck, mm -hmm. they can cite them. But mm -hmm. this is the problem we have with McEwen. Every, and Joe knows this, every month we have a problem over there because it's constantly getting littered but due to all those trucks that aren't supposed to be on that road right now. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so, you know, and of course we're citing the trucks as we can when, when our police can be over there, but we can't do it every single day. Um, mm -hmm. But Pearl, you're absolutely right. That's um, one of the problems we have. And, and you know, if anybody has any good ideas for how to address that, uh, I think our board needs to hear about, and sustainability needs to hear about that mm -hmm. because we've talked about other than citing them and then we have our trash pickups and and then we're we, we do have more money in the budget this year eric mm -hmm. we were able to do that too you might want to speak to that well the, the other thing too is this is kind of the problem time of the year yeah uh, because absolutely. what we do a lot we do litter pickup associated with the mowing that happens along roadways mm -hmm. and so that naturally happens during the growing season but now we're in <laughs> that off season and we have to do just targeted yeah. pickups where we can we've tried to raise awareness in terms of um the, the anti-littering campaign and that's not just for the public you see them on the mm -hmm. sides of the sanitation trucks but it's also uh trying to do communication to contractors et cetera, to make sure they know about their responsibility to cover and and, mm -hmm. and make sure that that doesn't happen so um you know it, it's multi-pronged we are sending crews out on a more regular basis joe's even hopped in and helped uh with that pickup yeah. himself so uh uh, we continue to look at that and have targeted areas there in, gosh, a month or so ago, probably six or seven areas, mm -hmm. um, uh, hit some areas today, uh, and we continue to look at that. And as you see areas, I uh, encourage you to let us know so we can get folks out there for that. Good job. And I, and I would just add that, um, well, in your presentation, you said uh, city staff picked up 129 bags and selected streets, just selected streets now, mm -hmm. in January alone. And then look at the other bags for the inmate, in, inmate yeah. uh, program. But, um, yeah, so we do have some more money in the, in the budget so our crews can go out at least once a month or so around town in different areas. But um, I, I really think that um, uh, we, in Cool Springs, we will initiate the um, Cool Springs trash size. It's not going to happen this spring because we wanted to do it right. I'm working with churches, I'm working with residents and constituents, working with businesses. And we're going to be getting together and having some meetings so we can get this off the ground. And I had a couple of them ask us to delay it to October. So we will start it in October for all of the of Ward 1. And, and we'll start that out over there. And um, maybe we can see how that goes. Maybe we can implement it in different wards. It's going to not just Ward 1. We want to see it all uh, over the city. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Y'all, they have to do that. Yeah. Y'all are hard. Just, just one Money. spot <laughs> on Mount Hope. Yeah. That needs, I, I don't know the answer to that, but mm. you say that's, uh, acts, a lot of this is accidental blowout trash. This is not accidental blowout trash. It is, it is absolutely, yeah. uh, they are with the purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is it over, yeah. overfilled cans or? Oh, no. It's yeah. everything. Yeah. Mattresses, yeah. furniture, yeah. everything. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. All the time. 
all the time. What we can do about that. And yeah. Jack knows about it, and Joe knows about it, and you know we all know about oh, yeah. it. I think in some areas uh, where you have codes a knows about yeah. it, um, but need it, it needs. I think we need to put cameras up. Yeah. Is it yeah, a high rental turnover? Or? Maybe it's when you have various. rental turnover, yeah. you have yeah. people yeah. clearing yeah. out yeah. houses. Yeah. 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 I, I'm not sure. It's yeah. not coming from <laughs> targeted, else. targeted uh, law enforcement there to catch some people, Possibly and then word gets around, cameras. and less Camera, people do it. Cameras is a good idea. Okay, yeah. thanks. Good report. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank we'll you. move on to item two, thanks. which is professional services agreement with Jackson Thornton Utilities <coughs> for revenue requirements analysis and cost of service rate study for the water, wastewater, reclaim water system, an amount not to exceed $17,000 for water and $20,000 for wastewater and $10,000 for reclaimed water. So this is uh, something we've done on a, on a pretty regular basis in terms of a rate study or cost of service study for our water, wastewater, and, and uh, reclaimed water systems. We are nearing the end of our existing five-year rate plan mm -hmm. and are at the point where we want to update that so that can feed into our budget and, and updated rate schedules as we move forward. So this would be the work that, that, that we've done a, a several times over the past uh, eight, nine years and uh, this, would, this would refresh that and look forward in terms of where we are in terms of the cost structure for <coughs> each of those independent uh, utilities. Again, they're, they're self-sufficient, so we need to look at generating the appropriate amount of revenue to, to run the businesses. So this helps serve as a very helpful guide in, in doing that. And I, I think the five-year rate plans have been very uh, beneficial to it, looking at long-term needs of, of, of the system. So. Uh, Mark and Michelle are here to address any questions or add anything to, sure. to that uh, effort. I'd like to, like to add, too, with rebidding of the water reclamation facility and yeah. almost finishing construction of the water plant, um, those, the data we get from that will be really useful in, in refining um, the path forward in terms of rates. So uh, happy to answer any questions. When will we be through with the water plant? The water plant? <laughs> Um, we're looking at the... the I was asked to get the question today. Just <laughs> yeah. as a of right. Um, so we're looking at the final commissioning schedules. The commissioning schedule is a two 30-day periods, and so we're about to start the first one. So probably a, a minimum of two months away. So we're, we're pretty close. Close so the to... the big pile of the door to be leveled out and... Correct. So we're, we're actually yes. turning things on and getting them operating and... Treating water. Yeah, the plant is actually process. operating. We're in that process of <coughs> right. kind of so. yeah. validating all that and getting it ready to so. go public. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to item three, which is a uh, draft resolution 2018-15, a resolution approving the design concept for the Southeast Municipal Complex. Have Lisa and our team come up and, and talk about this. We had a public meeting. Uh, early in the month uh, have done some additional work from the feedback we got at that meeting as well as looking at the two different concepts that had been presented at that time and wanted to bring that to you uh, for discussion and feedback as we continue to move along in that that design process so Lisa take it away thank you um, I have with me uh, Steve Fritz with Barge Design Solutions he's mm -hmm. going to take you through a uh, a PowerPoint that kind of brings you up to speed, but we've had uh, great support. Even though not everyone signed in, um, we had around 140 come out for our public forum that many of you were able to attend. So I just also like to publicly thank the core committee. There's about 35 to 40 individuals in our community that kind of set aside several hours of their personal time to, to work through this process with us, and um, they're their comments and their time was very valuable and, and we still appreciate that. So I'm just gonna turn it over to Steve, he'll take us through and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. So, do we have a PowerPoint Okay. I mean, if need be, I can talk from, from yeah. this and then.
I mean, I can talk <coughs> from. You want to go from the map? I, I can. I can. I'll have to go through some other things that'll, that are prompt. It, but it's on our. Uh, it's on. I we have it. Yeah, have it. But I don't think I had it before. Today, maybe I didn't have it when I first. They downloaded. they had two copies, and there was an updated one to you today. So what you have is the most up to date yeah. one. Yeah. Thank you. So that's two twenty seven eighteen on our. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So they have exactly. the PowerPoint. If you want to. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you all to watch it. It. Yeah, if you all have the PowerPoint, then I can sure. I can just talk through it as you're sure. looking at it on the screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first slide there that's noted planning process where we are is within the the public uh, mm -hmm. uh, board of mayor and alderman input. Following this, we'll be refining the plan and then moving to the uh, to the next phase. The next slide just has some key site information. Um, to remind you, I know all of you know where the site is, but it's 180 acres, 173 of which is in the, the floodway, 69 is in the 100-year floodplain, and then there's 38 acres that's completely out of the floodplain. So it's a pretty challenging site from that perspective. So the next slide is titled Core Planning Team. Uh, Lisa mentioned the people that we were working with here, and this just gives you an indication of all the representation on that group. It's primarily city uh, parks and engineering staff, neighborhood groups, uh, local youth uh, sports program providers, Friends of Franklin Parks, Williams Kent County Visitors Bureau, uh, the there Connectivity is, Committee, right? and so forth. Yeah, that guy's in there. Okay. Thank you. Oops. Oops. Oh, they had it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm lucky I was about to start singing, so. You <laughs> are? <laughs> All right, so. To give you an indication about how we got to where we are today, uh, we start. We kicked this off back in August of 2017 with a core planning team uh, visioning meeting where we sat down with them, reviewed the recommendation that flowed out of the, the comprehensive plan that we finished a couple of years ago that was the impetus for this park, for it to be a, a primarily a sports related facility to provide for recreation needs in the community. There was a list of needs from the master plan, and then we got some additional suggestions from the core planning team about what they would like to see in the park. We also did last fall the uh, Carruthers Parkway traffic counts for the traffic analysis. We performed a site analysis of the site to identify opportunities and constraints. Um, we did a preliminary engineering analysis for the reclamation plant layout so that we, the future potential reclamation plant, so that we could get an idea about what the footprint of that facility might be so we could plan the park around it. We looked at flooding impacts on the site and then also worked with the, the, the staff to determine the best road and bridge access locations. So we developed some a couple of concept plans and we met with the core planning team in January to review those plans with them. So the February 5th public meeting, we had a great crowd. We had 87 people that signed in. I'm sure there was a few more there that didn't sign in because I counted over 100 myself when I'd counted the people in the chair. So it was a great turnout. We had about 60 comment cards and emails that the public submitted to us. Um, and we have all those. If any of you would like to, to see them, of course, be glad to supply those. Uh, Lisa has all that information, but the top uh, sort of high points were the people wanting an inclusive playground in the park, um, the need for additional sports fields in, in the, uh, uh, here in the city, uh, comments about needing or wanting pedestrian and bicycle connections from the surrounding neighborhoods into the park, uh, and then traffic concerns. And then during the public meeting, and I know several of you were there that evening, um, we had a lot of comments about traffic concerns, and I think my sense of that was it was about the park, but it wasn't about the park, that there was just concerns in general about traffic on Carruthers and not wanting to do anything that would exacerbate that. Um, uh, the inclusive playground was another hot topic, and then again, the need for additional sports fields in the community. So I'll, I'll go real quickly through the, uh, through the plan, um, and I'm gonna be pointing to the, to, the, to the screen with a laser, if I can get it to work. So we've got two points of access. We've got one here along Carruthers that's right across from the Lockwood Grand Main Entry. 
and then on the other end, a potential south entry that would eventually go over to Long Lane. The city staff is having some discussions with folks that are property owners or developers that are here <laughs> about the potential of that, that access point. We've got a trail system that's shown along the Harpeth River. It's about two miles in length. We did get some comments in the public meeting about wanting to look at bringing it up here along the interstate. And from a user perspective, You'd add some length, but it's noisy up there. You're right up under those power lines. The terrain is steep. We'd have to have a lot of switchbacks in order to get that trail through there at a 5% grade. So we're not quite sure that's a, a good thing to do, but we certainly would look at that as we get in the detailed design. So the access comes across with a new bridge here at the, at the uh, Harpeth River. This road is gonna have to be elevated 10 plus feet up out of the floodplain in order to get the bridge in and then across onto the site. This area I call the neighborhood park component because primarily it's comprised of a lot of components that you typically would see in a neighborhood or community park. Um, there's a parking area here. There's a, a um, pavilion and restroom, a playground, and this is shown in two pieces, but as the design goes forward, we may end up making that one large playground instead of two separate ones. Um, there's a dog park here. Uh, in the plan that we presented to the public on the 5th, there were two sports fields that were here in this location. And after some comments that we got at the, the uh, public meeting and also con uh, talking with the staff, we've taken those out. There is a, uh, ba uh, a bowling lawn, a bocce courts, basketball courts, sand volleyball courts, a pavilion, and then some pickleball. Uh, courts that are here in this location. For those of you that don't know what pickleball is, maybe all of you do, but it's a, one of the fastest growing sports in the country. It's played primarily by folks like me, older. Uh, it's a mini tennis uh, thing, so I get that question a lot. It's the reason I, I wanted to explain what it was, so uh, sorry if, if you already knew. So here is the main athletic portion of the complex. There are 10 large sports fields, and these multi-purpose fields are, are size to accommodate lacrosse. Lacrosse is the largest uh, user. It has the largest field dimension, so we've got them for lacrosse, rugby, football, etc. So uh, the county runs the soccer program, so it's not intended that these fields would be used for soccer. They'd be used for things other than soccer that use big multi-purpose fields. Um, the, in the central portion of this is the central building. It's a restroom, concessions. It would also have storage space for the Franklin Cowboys football equipment. It would have space for weigh-ins for the Franklin Cowboys. They weigh in the players each time they come to play and other storage areas inside that building. Um, here at the, the main entrance, we have a, another playground and a splash pad and a couple of pavilions. We did have comments in the public meeting about people wanting to see that splash pad move up here. Um, we also had some comments from people that are, have kids that are playing uh, sports on those multi-purpose fields that they had, they, they had a hard time keeping them out of the water before in another park before they got to the field. So, they, so, so we'll look at that to see if that's appropriate or, or not. Uh, adequate parking to serve the complex is located here. The maintenance building is in this area. Uh, it's outdoor storage, um, indoor storage for equipment and so forth, offices for the park staff, and then a um, potentially a storm shelter in the facility. So this is the area where the, that's reserved for the reclamation facility. Um, it's all of the area that's out of the floodplain basically is up in this, this part of the site. We also have noted these green areas are some constructed wetlands that we want to incorporate a lot of sustainability ideas, and this is in the write-up that I sent for the park to treat stormwater and so forth here along the, uh, the, the Harpeth River. Um, we've got um, a number of detailed complex engineering studies that will have to take place going forward. Um, doing a park like this in the floodplain is, tip, is normal for parks to be in the floodplain, but there's a, it's complex to come up with the flood modeling and all the things that have to be done in order to, to, to get it permitted. Uh, so there's a lot of work we've got to do going forward that may result in some tweaking to the plan. Uh, you know, locations or where things are exactly may change a little bit as we go through that. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that that could be coming. 
So the next steps for us would be to be incorporate any comments that you all have. <coughs> uh, now, once we have an approved plan and we know how many parking spaces we've got and fields we have and so forth, we can finalize the traffic study for recommendations for improvements, particularly at the Carruthers entrance into the park. Um, we would prepare an opinion of cost and a phasing plan. Um, we'd work with staff to say, okay, here's what the prior first priorities are and here's how much money we have for the first phase to come up with a phasing plan over time. Uh, we have already started working on the branding study and what that branding is. It's coming up with a name, suggested name for the park and also the graphic image that that name connotes. In other words, the graphic images of what, what would, would represent the park. <coughs> that probably will go beyond us finishing up the, the master plan that we're planning on finishing in early April. Um, but that work probably will not be done by then. Um, but we plan to issue the draft plan in early April that would first go to the core planning team and then to, to uh, others in the city for, uh, for final reviews and approvals and changes that we need to make. And then once that's completed, we, we would be prepared to, to move into construction documents to uh, do the detailed design to, uh, that would be necessary to get the park under construction. So. Go ahead, Alderman Bransford. The traffic study to finalize it. That, res that corridor is constantly growing with new residents. Right. So are you anticipating growth or are you just using current traffic numbers? Because every week or month there's a new right. set of homes right. and cars coming into that area. We're, so we're, how, are you, how are you measuring that? I'm not a traffic engineer, but mm -hmm. I'll try to answer. And Jason, if you can, can mm -hmm. do it, if you'd I'm like. I'm sorry, I'm sitting mm -hmm. back because I know traffic will come up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we, we've gotten information from, uh, Carl's given us uh, projections. Oops. We've gotten from planning, uh, mm -hmm. like the number of, of, uh, of platted lots okay. that are along mm -hmm. Carruthers. Mm -hmm. um, now, like Steve says, once we know kind of what we're looking at, number of fields, just exactly what activities are going to be used at the park. We can put all that together uh, and finalize a traffic study and come up with uh, what, what projected improvements we'd need to do uh, to Carruthers Parkway to get us in and out of the park. Um, we'd also be looking at, I think we're looking at level of services uh, at various intersections up all the way, I think all the way up to 96 is one of the uh, uh, locations we'll be looking at. So. We're going to be doing a detailed study. Okay. Um, it's just at this point we're kind of at the concept phase, getting all the pieces together to throw into that uh, into that cake. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman Blanton, then Alderman uh, Barnhill. I have a few things. Yes, um, I don't talk too much, but <clears throat> so why are we seeing one plan instead of having the option of two? Because we saw two in the meeting. So that's if you want to answer that, then I'll go on to the next thing. I'll defer to Lisa. Well, one of the things we want to be able to do is we heard from basically from the general public what was the things that you liked, what you mm -hmm. didn't like. And so um, instead of doing that at a later date again to bring it to you and then bring it back to you again, we went ahead and combined those two. That's still very much an option to you all. We can definitely provide those, those two Because it's plans. hard to remember side by well, side I, what, I, I'll what's, tell you what's being my, left out. My, my perception. Okay. Most of the people that were there that expressed a preference expressed a preference for the concept two. Okay. Yeah, which I don't feel like is this concept this is, two. This was yeah. one, and the reason most people objected to concept two, they objected to concept, uh, the, uh, concept two? one, okay. is because of those sports fields that were up here. Correct, and the in the okay. little they check that out. Okay, and that's gone. But, but all of the elements that were in there, we haven't removed any elements right. except for those two sports yeah. fields. So and what? What? So, so according to her question, yes, ma'am. What are we? Can I piggyback off of that? Yeah. What are we missing in in one? Well, that's what he just said. Then is just those two fields. That's it. But it's also that's placement of, of what you call, what did exactly. you call it, the neighborhood park? Yeah, and, and what, Because in what the we, second one, the pickleball and all that was, it was more. All, it was all down here. Right. Okay. Yeah. And it really segregated those uses. I, and and to, to me, I and I think to the, from what I heard from the people that were there, that this is a much better solution from particularly from being able to, let's say this is a yeah. big, a big tournament's going on down here. Okay. Could, could you? Hit that map in the back. 
And Is it easier? Easier. Okay. Sure. Easier. So I think all of us are looking that way. But let's say a big tournament's going on down here. Mm -hmm. People here in the community can still access that without having to deal with the crowds and, and the traffic yes. and so forth. Mm -hmm. from. And if on the other concept, <laughs> we had some of those features that were up here we're down here so it gets yeah. local residents having to get down and i'm not arguing but it's just yeah. when we first had a meet public yeah. meeting we right. had two options and now we're right. seeing one right. so i can't remember what elements i loved of what's not on there well Absolutely. i think what we tried to do if we're the we ones that have to make the ultimate decision right. it's not on there though what we tried to do was based on what we heard from the public we tried to bring back what we thought was the best of both worlds from the planet. okay to you, and I think we've done that from. Yeah, from but we can definitely we can give you the other, give you the other two. To but compare. this is a blending of those two. I just correct. wasn't presented that yeah, way, so okay. it confused me because I'm wondering which option it looks like one to me. Well, which is it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, um, the other thing. Some things removed and some adjustments. Correct. The other, and I have just a couple more things. The and I'm not a parking engineer. I don't know. Um, I have heard um, some people say they're concerned about the parking. And I'm not saying that's going to be an issue, but my question is, is there an opportunity to add parking anywhere if we see that it's not going to be enough? Well, Could we add it up I, in that floodplain area at the top left or no? Probably not. And, and I, I hope what I'm about to say will give you a little bit of comfort in sure. terms of the parking numbers. All right. So we've been doing complexes like this for 25 years, and we keep up with parking demand in these complexes. And so we know um, that how many spaces per field. Based on the turnover and game Based times. on the turnover and so forth. And um, we have not had, I've had two projects over the last 20 plus years that parking has been a bit of an issue. And both of those projects were at the bottom end of what we recommend. We typically recommend about 50 spaces per field as a, as a bare minimum. And the ones that are towards that bottom end tend to ha have some issues. This one, I can't remember, but I think it's 60 or 65 is what we base this on. I'm confident you won't have any parking problems in the, in, with respect to that, that concept based on, a, based on our long history of doing these, uh, these parks. Now, if you have a huge, if you have a huge <laughs> festival out here, <laughs> You know that that uh, or something of that nature, then 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 all right. bets are off. But if it's just being operated as a park with these uses, I'll feel very comfortable uh, telling you that you should not have a parking problem. All right, last thing, and that's the elephant in the room. So based on the fact that there's a potential, which I know we're going to need it, the water reclamation facility, has that <laughs> been considered as far as where we're staging things based on potential? odors that might I mean I know we're way we're working way past that I mean so it's not the problem it would have been 20 years ago but did we bring that into our minds when considering where things are staged on the property mark go for it it was considered um, really the the technology that's going to be used at right. this facility if we choose to use this property for a reclamation facility is going to have to consider the uses that surround it um, okay. So yeah, that it is. It was Trying part of the like part that, of the yeah. discussion during the park. If we end up moving forward with a water reclama reclamation facility at this property, it'll be certainly Kind of technology a big is definitely advanced. So, so, so yeah. Okay. Just you also have certain say it. Uh, certain functions yeah. or elements of the treatment process <laughs> fully enclosed. Correct. And some elements to work with the the site and with the proximity to the park. I mean, it's all <laughs> part of what we're. We we even dug into the if I may the day to day. I meant, uh, yeah, no, no, literally, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, but how how trucks will move through the site? How will, how will this function, this particular public works department, function with our public works department? So I think all of those things had to be considered, and you're kind of seeing what we believe would be a good, at least a thirty thousand foot view. And what we've earmarked for the reclamation plan is is out of the floodplain. Correct. 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 Okay. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Alderman Barnhill. Two or three comments, I guess. Oh. I want to make sure that 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 we understand what where I'm coming from. We have shortchanged the Cowboys program, the Franklin Cowboys football program now for the last 20 years, and actually the baseball has probably ruled them out. Are there enough fields to to accommodate here? The 
boys, the, the Cowboys football program. Now, that being, that being said, the lacrosse, the, the, the whatever else that you got on there, those were fine. That, the, 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 the vision that I had when we first started this is that we would have another, say, similar to Jim Warren Park. This is far exceeded anything that we've looked at as far as the Jim Warren Park concept is concerned. And that's what we're looking at is to make sure we've got enough athletic fields. Now, there may be a, and because I, I, I was at the meeting and I heard the guy from Bellevue say that he coached lacrosse and he wanted to know if he would have a practice field and whatever else it was. And, and I don't want to be completely, totally tacky about that, <laughs> but that's not what this is all about. That's not what this is about. Now, you go back and you say that you're looking at a traffic study. And you can look at your traffic study. The traffic's already there. I'm not sure that the traffic study doesn't show how much is being generated, not how much is there now, but how much is coming out of this right here. Because it's generally only going to come out, the major portion of it will probably come out on Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon. And that's just not your uh, 7 to 9 and 3 to 5 Monday through Friday traffic patterns that you're looking at then. But I want to make sure that we, that this, what my understanding is, and, and uh, that we've got what we're looking for here as far as, I don't want to say youth fields, but youth fields that accommodate the programs that we have here in Franklin. And, the, and, the Cow and I think anybody would sit in here would admit that the Cowboys program has been short, short changed, if not rooted out, over the last 15 to 20 years. So. Um. According to what Lisa and Paige and others have told us, that four fields will be sufficient to serve the Franklin Cowboys Good need. Okay, that's what I understand. Okay, Lisa, is that correct? Yeah, I, for their programs right now and for yeah. growth, but with ten fields okay. sitting ten here, fields. they want to be able to for from a tournament. One of the things that Franklin <coughs> Cowboys see as an option is that. Yes, you have girls that are the cheerleaders, but they also see that girls want to play. And um, so they're looking at even considering what flag football would be. Allowing then to expand into all of these fields, you wouldn't have to where there might be times that lacrosse takes up one and, and football's on the others. But for tournaments or things that they want for growth, this allows for that. And so we've accommodated that. And I could see a, a, a large tournament or large potential for growth <laughs> if you've got the facilities that are nice, attractive, that are there, mm -hmm. then you will see growth in that particular segment of what we're uh, furnishing. So I, I think, you know, Lisa and her staff recognized long ago what you said about the Cowboys and one of the driving forces behind this was our analysis of Jim Warren that said we've got to get the Cowboys out of Jim Warren Park and find them a you know an appropriate place to, to be. In terms of the traffic you're exactly correct that the, the, the traffic that's going to be coming in and out of this park is off peak. It's in the evenings and it's on weekends so it's, it's definitely off peak. Alderman Berger, you say Alderman John? Yeah. Didn't you say you had lacrosse fields in here? Yes. Yes. All of them will accommodate lacrosse. Mm -hmm. Oh, they will. Okay. I'll do football or lacrosse. Okay. Or a combination. Uh, of. Yeah. Um, so what you've done is you've blended two options and gave us the best of both the options with the elements that the people desired. Correct. That, that you, that the people wanted. The two that in, in that the two was concepts. my interpretation yeah. of the comments. So you took that what they done. desired in the two concepts and put them together. Correct. Is what I'm hearing yes, you saying. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, and I like the I like the fact on this um, diagram that on the left side over there that you've got it separated from the fields. So right. I think that's important. I think you have to keep it that way because you you don't want to, you know, when people want to use the park, they you know if the games are going on, they don't want to be having that on both sides. So I agree with that. The other thing is, um, could I ask you why tennis courts were not considered here? Because I constantly hear people saying we don't have enough tennis courts, and that's a huge issue. I just I'll, I'll have to that. go back. Yeah. I'll have to go back and look at 
the comprehensive study, but I do not believe that the mm -hmm. comp plan identified the need for tennis courts. Mm -hmm. it, it identified pickleball. I mean, I granted, because yes. so, we've got, you have tennis yeah, I know at, that at too. Jim Warren, we've got some plan, but county has a large tennis program too. So there's a, we're not there's seeing, we see it from the recreation. As well. mm -hmm. Sir, yeah, there's a lot of private tennis courts. There is a lot of private. Yeah, people, it, it doesn't people, mean there's not a need, but yeah, there we, is a need. for in the park that, yeah. um, a lot of the stuff we're, we will be putting in the floodplain, um, mm -hmm. and it does make a difference. Now, I will say to you, in the FSD, the Franklin Special School District, we have identified sites for additional tennis mm -hmm. courts um, for future. So it's not that we aren't ignoring it, but for this for, particular for area, we did not. And Team play, team, team or, or just or individual general public. Or general public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yes, I, I think we've also looked at Liberty has the potential it to have some tennis it's courts in the as well plan in that master plan. Part, so yeah. you've got it in some other places, yeah, but not necessarily. All, Liberty, Liberty here. has all that land just sitting there. So there's more. Like, yeah, there's more phases of Liberty used. to to come yeah, forward. Okay, to. and the other thing, um, the only other comment I have is, uh, you know, you talk about naming the park. Have we ever decided, we ever talked about naming the park, you know, you take corporations, you take individuals' names, and, and having somebody, you know, like Bridge Bridgestone, they do naming rights for what, five years, 10 years, something like that, Correct. and then they change the name or they get the same name back depending on who wants to opt the ante and do, <coughs> do another uh, sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So why don't we think outside the box about sponsorships for names mm -hmm. and have have people, individuals or companies. Uh, and we, you know, and we've done that yeah. with the Tractor Supply uh, yeah, right. Arena at Harlandsdale. Yes, we have. The dog parks are have a naming uh, exactly. arrangement with Mars. So uh, I think we've actually even done a policy yeah. around mm -hmm. that as a board. So okay. we can revisit that with you as I think as that, that naming is discussed. Yeah. But that that mm -hmm. that is uh, a mm -hmm. framework's already set up for us to explore that. Exactly. I was just going to refer to that mm -hmm. at, at Tractor Supply mm -hmm. because I think that would be a good idea to look at this park. And I think what we're not talking about, but the new Lockwood property, <coughs> all of this would be one name of some sort. Now, again, it might be a specific complex that mm -hmm. we do look at naming rights for, which I think is, is a very positive thing. But we're looking at that as over 200 acres is what is the name for the entire, not just this particular, but when Robertson Lake and all of that come on board, should it be one? And then that, that's something we'll be bringing back to you, but we'd like to, we're just now beginning to get in that process. Well, you could have a name for all of it, and then you could have specific names for the different Absolutely. sections. Mm -hmm. Now, I wouldn't say a different name for every field, and with different sections. Sure. And Thank that you. way you could bring on multiple people on board, <clears throat> excuse me, who would gift the, gift the city to the parks department for that money that would go to maintain this particular park. It would have to be on this park. Sure. Yeah, I just when, when you look at the collective 200, and mm -hmm. it's now 250, 260 acres when you add the Robinson Lake Lockwood parcel to the <coughs> north. Right. They kind of are sort of their own unique neighborhoods. You've got the yeah. lake and you've got the more passive <coughs> space around it. You've got this area that Steve kind of referred to as more of the neighborhood park character and just has some open space around it. And then you've got kind of the sportsplex <laughs> to mm -hmm. the south with the multiple fields and the, that, that type yep. of use. So you almost can break it into those three or four segments and think of them as almost their own neighborhoods, kind yeah. of their, their own kind of parks yeah, that, within that's one <coughs> large complex. That's one of the things that we've talked with a branding consultant about is the opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to subname things within yeah. a broader I think that would be excellent. vision. Here's yeah. the big name and then you know, sub names behind, yep. behind it. So the, the sponsorship could absolutely work. I would be very with interested something in like that. that. Yeah. Can you point out the lake up here? It's, it's, it's just it's north. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's north. On the left side of the page. Okay. Up mm -hmm. off of it. Up off of it. Keep going. For 10, yeah. right that is right a lake. Yeah. <laughs> Back up. Okay. All right. Just well, to make sure. Is it, it that far down? Right yeah. It's not shown. That, that, that total parcel is around 77, 78 acres, including the lake. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I've got one, uh, if I might. Um, I, I spent some time this week uh, meeting with uh, uh, some people who are very interested in inclusive playground, and I have some experience with that because our orthopedic academy used to, every year when we visited a city, 
you know, we all built an inclusive pro program in some of the larger cities in America. Uh, but one of the things that uh, impressed me from talking with this group was that, you know, I've, I've kind of always thought of the kids and wheelchairs and things like that, but we have adults with disabilities too. So uh, I didn't quite hear anything that addressed that. Is that just more refinement and overall plan as you go well, forward? And, we, and maybe this isn't the location. Well, I think no, I, 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 if I didn't, I should have. I think the the write-up says that this playground is for all ages and all abilities, and that's what we would intend to do. It would accommodate not only children, but all, that, yeah. everyone <laughs> with all ages and all abilities. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's gonna be, we know how important that is, so we will be spending a lot of effort in the design of that playground to make sure we get it right. Great. And one of the things in the broader planning, master plan, <coughs> is sort of a chain of events we talked about baseball and, and football, the shift with Jim Warren, but it also opens up the great opportunity to do Miracle Field yeah, at Jim, Jim Warren, Warren. Oh, which yeah. is another form of an inclusive play area, mm -hmm. so, and, uh, and fits very much with the, the theme of Jim Warren. So these kind of, that kind of links together with the development of this park and creating that opportunity too. Yeah, and the, uh, the Miracle Field was mentioned in the comprehensive plan at Jim Warren mm -hmm. Park. Great. Okay, uh, we're gonna Sorry. move on then. Adam Thank Cole, you. we're gonna defer. To uh, the first meeting in March. Get back to you. Uh, so we'll go to number five, which is a discussion and guidance on modifying the City of Franklin's hours of construction, specifically reducing the current subjectivity associated with staff having to determine whether construction noise is a nuisance. All right, this is a, we wanted to open this up for some discussion with the board and some feedback. Uh, this is something we run into on a pretty regular basis with. Uh, ongoing construction activities in and around neighborhoods, et cetera, and as neighborhoods develop. And wanted to kind of walk through with you what we're experiencing and some ideas on how to work with what's in place and what we might be able to put in place to be responsive to those needs, but also recognize um, how that process works. So uh, Vernon and Lieutenant Will Hyde are here to uh, talk to you about our experience and talk about where we might go from here. Thank you, Eric, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, I want to start this this conversation that we're only only looking for for guidance because over the last number of years we continue to see an increase in construction activity and investment, and with that comes problems of disruption in in neighborhoods. And particularly over the last couple of years, Lieutenant Wilhite and I have come to know each other much more than we have in the past because. She's contacted me early in the morning, after hours at night on weekends and holidays when her team has, has run into situations because there is some ambiguity with, with the ordinance that we have in place that was established uh, many years ago. So uh, from where we're talking and coming to you from is we're, our police department in particular, but also our building and neighborhood services staff and those that take calls from citizens, are spending an inordinate amount of time um, monitoring when people come to work. And um, I think we can do, we have some recommendations to do better, but I'll, I'll let Lieutenant Wilhite uh, look over, go through some of the challenges that we <laughs> bullet pointed here, just to give you a, a taste of the challenges that we're dealing with. I wanna say thank you for um, letting us speak tonight. The issues, that, the challenges that the police department that we have is going to a construction site and somebody's calling in, but distinguishing the, the loudness of the noise. And because it's loud to one person, it's always by perception. And so when the officers arrive on scene, it may not be as loud as the individual that's calling in and saying it is. So we're having to distinguish whether or not it really is a violation or if it's not. We have people that call in at 5.45 in the morning because materials are being delivered for the six o'clock start line. Do we allow the trucks sit there and idle? Or do we ask them to move? And so, again, these are just the little challenges in which we are being sent to. And, you know, we, we talk about this, but as a development that took place, um, in Amelia Park, we were getting calls constantly, and it was just on weekends at night. I would get receive phone calls at nine o'clock at night about 
somebody's working. And so I would have to try to send an officer out there. It wasn't affecting the developer because of that $50 fine that the subcontractor is receiving that citation for. And so we finally were able to work around it where it was the developer that we end up having to cite. As we all know that sometimes it doesn't affect them until it impacts them personally. And so when we were taking up their time for them to come into city court to either pay the fine or show up to court, and it's not the subcontractor, that's when we were starting to make the impact. Also with that, it also ended up being that the stop work order because we were getting so many. And I have a packet that is probably about four inches thick of all the complaints for just this one development. Mm -hmm. And so we constantly are trying to, to work with everyone and saying what is and what is not because we need some clarification in certain areas. The one thing that we see also is residential. As we all know, we like to improve our home, the landscaping, and the enjoyment that we have. But when you hire a contractor to come in, it's on the weekend because it might be after hours when you get home from work. What do we do about the contractor then? So it's in a residential area, but then again, it's not just your, your normal household, the tools that are being used because they're trying to make, build a pool in the backyard. <coughs> the clarifications that we're trying to do is the hours of operation, the distinguishing of what is occupied, what is not, just to give us a little bit more guidance. And that's what we're trying to, to, to do here tonight. So, um, if, uh, thank you, Lieutenant. And what she, what uh, Joanne brought up is that um, delivery of materials before 7 a.m. in the morning, sometimes as early as 545 and after six o'clock at night is an issue. Um, also, the current ordinances in our municipal code under offenses against peace and quiet. So it, it, it puts a burden on our police officers to distinguish what's an offense against the peace and, and quiet, what's too loud or not. And then the other um, issue, and there are several others, but the other one that uh, Lieutenant brought up is about homeowners that may do work um, on weekends or on holidays and are they regulated by this ordinance so uh, I'll ask Vicki to, to, to go to the the second page here if, if you will and we'll walk through through some of these and first of all the hours of construction in, in the city of Franklin by the ordinance are Monday through Friday 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Saturdays 9 p.m. to 6 p.m. no work is to occur on Sundays and holidays but again the, the definition of the noise, it deals with, the definition of the construction deals is noise-based. So in researching some, some other um, communities, we, we want to perhaps have you consider differentiating between hours of construction that are in a, a greenfield new development on unoccupied buildings as opposed to a building that's occupied. So for example, a residential subdivision. When a, a subdivision is just getting started, um, nobody's living in the neighborhood, but all of a sudden when somebody moves in, they're in close proximity to that noise. And perhaps when we're in that situation, if the construction activity is within a, a thousand feet and there's other jurisdictions that use this, that the hours are strict, seven to six, nine to six on Saturday, and nothing on Sundays or holidays, <coughs> period. So um, that way that if somebody's in those neighborhoods, there's no work inside or outside going on at all. One thing that uh, Lieutenant Will I didn't mention is the thefts that go on on construction mm -hmm. sites. When people are working inside dwellings late in the evening, and they may have the windows open or not with radios and compressors going, painting, and using air guns, um, it's hard for them to distinguish who, and the neighbors that are now living in the neighborhood, who should be in the neighborhood 
working and who's trying to do some malicious activity. So, so keep that in mind. So I wanna, we wanna throw that out right now. Is there merit to having hours of construction for dwellings that are new, under construction, unoccupied, just to have the hours firm from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and not based on, on noise. And then on Saturdays, it would be from 9 to 6, instead of mm -hmm. having it based on noise. And this would be for new buildings and buildings that are not occupied. So what about my neighbor that wants to mow the yard at 7.30 on Saturday? That's... <laughs> he moved, by the way, but <laughs> not none too soon. That, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point, and we're going to bring, bring, the, bring that up because um, landscaping is allowed 7 to 9, so your neighbor that wants to mow the lawn, or somebody that comes in and has a landscaping company. Our ordinance allows landscaping work to occur from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., Monday through Sunday and on holidays. It doesn't distinguish. Seven to what? Seven to nine. Savages. <laughs> well, as there's sort of an unwritten uh, code yeah. on that. As, a, as Joanne mentioned. It's all right, I'll lift weights and play my uh, tool radio until three in the morning. We'll see how long that war lasts. As Joanne mentioned, you know, we do have this issue with homeowners that purchase a home and may want to do work by on their own landscaping work or not improvements put in a pool build a deck that we would just we'll get to that point we could distinguish between people that have a vested interest in a neighborhood because you're going to have to live next to your neighbor and as alderman mcclendon said if they want to go back and forth with making noise to themselves <laughs> That might be, e that's far and few between those types of situations. Well, go ahead, Alderman time, time is money. And if I was a homeowner and I was putting on a, an addition or closing my screen in porch or on, adding right. on um, an awning to the back porch or whatever it is, um, so you got people there and they want to work and, you know, especially in the winter time it's dark at 5 4 30 5 o'clock and so I, I don't know I, I, ju I just would think that you you're paying for these people to be there and then you've got time limits and you don't want to stretch this on for weeks and months and so you know that, that I know it's a tricky thing but most neighbors especially in established neighborhoods though I think um they know that you know if somebody's going to add on. They're going to have noise. They're going to have pounding of the, you know, just like the other day, somebody had a new roof put on, and there was this constantly all day long in the house going, oh gosh, you know. So we just went and got our earphones and put our earphones on and did our work, and um, the, the people can improvise. And I'm not saying that we don't protect our peace and quiet in in the. But I get these calls all the time, and, and we had, in Karen Bridge and Enclaves, we had issues all the time because the hotel that's being built up there on uh, I-65 at Cool Springs, they were jackhammering, and then they couldn't jackhammer during certain times because the people next door were in the office buildings trying to work. Mm -hmm. But yet they had to get the work done. And so um, I think Eric had to give them a pass on some of that stuff to get it done. Yeah. And, and then I had the people in enclaves, and the weather was nice. They were out in the patio. They were having dinner. They had guests over. And here they hear all this noise. And it's quite a ways away, but they hear it. And um, hearing it's one thing. Being disturbed by it's another. So, I, yeah, I think we've got a bit of a dilemma, but we've got to let people work. We've got to let people get their work, get in, get their work done, and get out. And then sometimes we impede that work by slowing them down. So the landscape, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., I don't think most people have a problem with that. But um, And then I, I would say, you know, how are you going to control, um, well, theft was the other thing. Um, I, may, I made, you know, that, that I'd like to know. How are we, how are we gonna, as a city, how do we do that? You have contractors that steal from contractors. So it's hard to determine yeah. because that person's not out of place. Mm -hmm. 
But if they're not supposed to be on site, mm -hmm. that makes it easier for us to distinguish mm -hmm. what, what is reasonable for us to, to stop and investigate mm -hmm. that situation. Mm -hmm. And so it, it allows us that little bit of leverage of going, this person doesn't need to be here. Yeah. But we can't be there all the time either. No, ma'am, we can't. And that's the hardest thing, that we do get a lot of calls that pulls us away from other things mm -hmm. that we should be doing. Yeah. And so, you know, you were talking about the landscaping, but it's all the household, mm -hmm. I mean, your most common tools that are used. Yeah. I mean, you have people that have wet saws, things yeah. of that nature. So do we regulate the residentials, I mean, the areas that we tell them that they can't use certain tools at certain hours? Or... You know, that's what we're trying to get some clarification yeah. because it's hard for us to enforce that. I, I can get, well, like, for, for, for instance, mm -hmm. so you said wet saw. So say mm -hmm. you're putting new tile in your house mm -hmm. and you've got a relative that comes up from out of town to help you on the weekend and you work into the night. Mm -hmm. Could you expect a knock on the door from the police to say, you've got a wet saw running at 10 o'clock oh, yeah. at night okay. and really? See, I think that might be a little bit too much. So, and, that, and that's what we're, we're asking, that we... In an existing residential yeah, home. Yes. That we differentiate between outside, somebody outside. living in their home that may be doing work themselves or with friends, that we, we really don't regulate that. Because how pervasive that's is like that? Or, yeah, or right. we could leave it more noise-based. But to just take away what a homeowner is doing, investing and in living in their property from those mm -hmm. that where we're truly developing. Where they're making money off Big of it. Big difference. Well, yes. yeah. yeah. It's a business but, versus a residential unit. And I want to be, be sensitive to the time because I know Mark, and we can come back, back again. This is just the start. Let me shift mm -hmm. just a little bit because Lieutenant Will, I brought this up, and um, this, this is a big part of the problem. Because of the volume activity going on, developers and contractors want to pay the $50 fee. There's something wrong with that when they say, how much is the penalty when you ask them to stop working? All right, and that's, that's a, a, con a state constitution fee. So what we would look at is a tiered approach because we know time is money to contractors. And we would look at you know, if, if there were more than a um, couple citations within a 12-month period that we would require them, perhaps, as an idea, to hire a private security firm. Yeah. So you're citing the, the developer, not the actual worker. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's what we're, we're doing on develop, project developments with multiple workers on it. We might have a single site with a general contractor, and they would be the developer, say. And then the other piece was that if the, sec the other idea, excuse me, that if the private security firm didn't do their job, that we would have a stop work order until we could have the contractor and developer come in and have a meeting and talk to them about when to come to work in the morning. <laughs> um, but those, those are, this is a real issue that we're <clears throat> continuing to experience and wanted to take a few minutes to bring it to you. When they yeah. said, what's the penalty, I'd say jail. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the... Such a action, but we're sort of limited. <laughs> this is I, the I don't think what city judges can put people in jail. <laughs> how many of your calls are related to maybe some damage to a home or property nearby? Mm -hmm. So you don't get those, like, you shattered my foundation or my walls or my... Mm -hmm. my now, usually on, on things like that is they go ahead and, and contact the developer to get the the insurance claims mm -hmm. and things of that nature started when there's yeah. um, maybe a crack in their foundation yeah. because they're they're blasting it in the close vicinity of their home we don't get that type of call okay. the calls that we get is just your your basic late, late hours yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 yeah. somebody's using a generator yeah. because they need to use an air gun yeah I, I like the idea of a security guard that will yeah. be part of the penalty yeah. that you will have to hire yeah. one and that security guard will sort of mm -hmm. direct the traffic as far as time to go time to get off the site is that what you're thinking yeah well that was that was a recommendation and then i want to make sure uh -huh. that you can have time for this i don't other. know that we do so oh. if you want to go ahead okay because <laughs> i'm not sure 
do it. There's enough time to do that. Yeah, I think justice. we'll so if you stop it quarter till okay. or less. Mm -hmm. Let, let me add one one thing just for your consideration. There, not a week goes by that Vicki and I aren't drafting uh, uh, some sort of modification that I'm allowing people to do work yeah. around it um, because they need to for certain reasons. And we're especially flexible around areas that have that. Um, they're further away from residential areas. I mean, we, we grant a little more latitude. So this concept of the 1,000 foot or, or some basis is kind of how we're operating on a pretty regular basis now where we we recognize that that's largely a commercial area residents are very far away and so we'll give them a little more uh, play around hours and and types of work at, at certain times and and by and large that seems to work okay we always qualify that as soon as we get complaints we'll we'll go back to the standard hours and and standards but but that is a, that is yeah, without it being in, in any formal structure, that's that's essentially what we're doing now is is granting some latitude to folks that are further away from residential and and especially the more the green field that that um, uh, Vernon and, and Joanne referenced. Alderman yeah, Martin. Uh, it's my understanding that not too long ago you all had a call at four thirty in the morning because we were getting the parking garage yes, cleaned. Yes, we did. And it was disturbing the neighbors yes, we did. at 4.30. And mm -hmm. I think uh, you all probably knew all about that. And so you stopped it. We did. But the, the situation that we're running into is because there was no clarification about city work. Okay. This is something of the parking areas, things of that nature. But as we know, there's some preparation that needs to be done prior to the regular business day going. Mm -hmm. And so... I understand that. And yeah. so, yes, we do get a call, and yes, we did put a stop to it one time. And, um, but that's another thing that we're looking at. Well, if we, we need to get some kind of answer to that. Maybe there's nothing that can be done. Maybe 4.30 is the time, yep. the only time it can be done. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seemed like a little early, but... It takes a while. It, it takes time, and you need to do it when the garage is pretty cleared it. out. And yeah. well, maybe bringing people in on a weekend costs us a lot more in maybe terms these of overtime folks, and disturbance. Maybe I could suggest that it's not even the only they go weekend. out of town. Right. That how often? Do, <laughs> how often does that happen? I think we do it quarterly. <coughs> Joe, quarterly we do the garage. Something like that every few months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would add that. I'll uh, just suggest they take a little vacation. <laughs> well, there's some common sense. Well, I want to I want to say that we're we're talking the big picture, the pervasive types of issues. Yeah, I know any that. city I know facilities, that. city essential operations, emergency repairs that people need to make, completing a certain yeah. phase of construction, pouring concrete, and you're getting to the end of the day, um, and also maintaining the city administrator's um, authority to grant yeah. approval under unique circumstances. Those things. We're not talking yeah. about here. Yeah. We're yeah. talking yeah. about the majority well, of people that are abusing the problem because they know that if if they get a citation, it's only fifty dollars. It's it's peanuts to them. Well, that the reason for that is that the city court can't give a that's right. That's as much <laughs> yeah. as we can. Plus court costs. Yeah, that's right. Add that. that's right. Another fifty dollars. That help you but, at all but to layer some layer some other layer things i think to layer some cool. other you, expectations we have another question. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah because <clears throat> okay so these questions um is there an interest in changing the hours of construction and make them the same as monday through saturday so monday through saturday 7 a.m to 6 p.m some consistency that, i know I, that people I, enjoy their weekends yeah. and that was a recommendation we wanted yeah. to throw out yeah I, is there I interest would, in that yeah i i think i would agree to that because uh, you know i don't see any harm in letting people start i mean this isn't unless it's going to be every saturday somebody's going to do something you know how, how how many times a year are you in a lifetime of your home are you building on or are you doing different things how, how often do you put a roof on those the kinds of things so you know uh, I think I think there should be some leeway there. Um, then you, you said, should we differentiate about the <clears throat> excuse me the hours of construction between greenfields and and uh, unoccupied buildings versus residential occupied? Absolutely, okay. uh, we have to we have to differentiate against uh, uh, among those two. 
uh, hours of construction. And then this one, apply without exception to all construction, whether it's indoors or outdoor. No, we have to, def you have to have a difference of that because indoors, if you have your doors and windows shut and you're working on a building, no one may hear it. Now, they may, depends what you're doing in there, depends what tools you're using too. So I think you gotta get some leeway there on that one. And then um, cleaning the streets. Yeah, you know, that's, that's gonna happen. You're gonna do that in the morning. And, and for the garage, if we're gonna clean the garage at 430, like this one, then the brownstones, the people around there ought to get a letter saying, next month on Tuesday at 430, we're gonna do the garage, be prepared. Just know it's coming, it has to be done, it has to be done when it's empty. So we just, as a courtesy, I think that would help. So the people at least know it's coming and then they're aware of it. And then the last one, I think, um, um, if we're gonna perform, uh, the city and its contractors and utility companies, with it, should there be an exception? Well, within reason, yeah. Maybe not all the time, but they're like the garage. There's a reason to start that at 4.30. So I, I think that's within reason and what's, what's reasonable and uh, what's needed. And then, um, then your authority, Eric, for city administrator, and it says perhaps a thousand feet or more from residential occupied building. I'm, I'm not sure it needs to be a thousand feet. It depends again, be, where the heck are yeah, you and how yeah. many houses around? Are you, are you next to 500 feet and you've got a thousand homes within that 500 feet or you know, within a thousand feet or something? You have a big subdivision, do you have just you know, well, if, you, if, it's, if you're the one person know. that's in there, though. Yeah, it, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you're disturbing more people, and, and sometimes I think these contractors, okay, then you talked about theft and everything, and then Pearl brought up uh, about monitoring, you know, about the $50 and all this. I, I think these developers, they're going to have to hire somebody to be on site to make sure that people are starting and stopping at the right times, but they're also going to have to hire somebody on there. Like I know Pat Emery has somebody over there all the time. Their, their contractors have somebody on site most of the time looking around and making sure that theft isn't taking place because, I mean, that's a big project. Maybe some of the smaller projects, people don't do that. But, um, you know, some of these, I think we have to be somewhat flexible on some of these. We have to, with, we have to get the job done, but yet, at the same time, it's, you know, it's a balance of trying to protect people's sanity and quiet, too. Kevin, that last comment. Yeah. So is it mom and pop type of... Uh, disturbances as well the little mom and pop when I said the local resident the homeowner and the some, neighbor some are yeah but some aren't uh, the majority that we had is um, reason saying you won't be able to hire a security guard for that but you can have a human component to that yes yes okay all right we'll be back at seven o'clock and, and did you address you. did you go ahead did you address um I know we're over there. Um, well, it could be like Rural Oaks. We've got, you know, of course, the blasting is one thing because we go through the state government. But it's kind of Rural Oaks. Somebody. Oh, just a little appreciation of me and the.